The lesson of it all is that, and taking the book of Job as an example, as it meant to our Armenian church fathers, we don't know. God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. Now, because God knows everything, what should my response of faith be? My response would be, I will leave it to God. I don't know. And since only God knows, I will surrender. I will yield it to God. And interestingly enough, Saint Nesesh Norhali comes exactly to this point in the 16th stanza of his prayer. So once again, welcome. My name is Arpin Akashian, and I serve at the Eastern Diocese of the Armenian Church of America, and I manage all aspects of Vemkar. And I'd like to give a special shout out to my colleague Vartan Sarkisian, who usually works quietly on Vemkar productions, including these sessions. So I'd like to emphasize that through his dedication and God-given talents, he produces much fruit that, that we all enjoy. So yes, anhamper ais ora gaspasei, vusam mer diroch zanunta yev nordar vamutka urachutiam piev arochutiam tima voretzik. Yes, mer astvain havakuita shad irabez garot tzadzem, yev guzem masnavora par shonagaruchun haidner ter pororin, vor mezigmi anak yerek shapti orera. Nortem kergdesnem ais irigun, pari egadzek, and welcome, welcome, welcome. I, I sure have missed our Tuesday evening gatherings where we discuss, share, and learn about our church, faith, our God. And this semester, we're focusing on various aspects of Lent. So I'd also like to thank my teammates of Vemkar Adult Christian Education, Rhonda Boyajian, who serves as the coordinator, Father Stepanos Dudukjan, Father Samuel Vrith Najarian, Deacon Yervant Kuchukian, Deacon Armen Terjimanian, Nancy Basmajian, of course, Vartan Sarkisian, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Roberta Irvin for her constant guidance and consultations. So at right now, like every semester, we will be starting with a prayer. But before we get into that, I just want to say that uh, Vemkar Adult Christian Education focuses on the Armenian Church's spirituality, teaching, liturgy, scripture, and history. So I'd, I'd want to emphasize that we would like to keep our sessions welcoming to all, and we highly encourage showing respect to other denominations, other religions, culture, and basically all people. So like last semester, we have selected two prayers and um, that we will start and end our sessions with. Both are prayers by St. Nersa Shnorhali, who Dr. Terian will be teaching us about in just a few moments. So once again, please make sure that your audio is muted. And Father Samuel, may you please lead us into prayer. Amen. I confess you with faith and bow down to you, indivisible light, united holy trinity, creator of light and banisher of darkness. Banish the darkness of sin and ignorance from my soul and illuminate my mind at this hour to pray as it pleases you and receive from you what I am seeking. Show loving kindness to your creatures and to me who have many sins. Havado Hostovanin, Yevyergir Bakanem Kez, Ampajanri Luis, Mias Nagan Surpir Tun, Yev Mias Fazitun, Ararich Luso, Yev Halazich Havari, Halazia Ihokvo Ime is Havar Megas, Yev Ankitian, Yev Musavoryaz Miracin, Ijamus Haismig, Avoterke, Zihajuis. Yevon to Neil Iken is Hunter Vadzin. Yevor Mia Korazots, Yevins Pazma Maris. Amen. Thank you, Derhaj. And now I'd like to um, invite our Vemkar Adult Christian Education Coordinator, Rhonda. Please, it's your screen. Thank you, Arpi. 
I would like to introduce our distinguished guest for our opening session, Dr. Abraham Tadian, Doctor of Theology, University of Basel, is Professor Emeritus of Armenian Theology and Patristics at St. Nurses Armenian Seminary, where he also served as Academic Dean and edited the St. Nurses Theological Review for 12 years the only Western language periodical on Armenian theology. Prior to his time at St. Narsis, he was professor of intertestamental and early Christian literatures at Andrews University for 20 years. And for four years, a recurring visiting professor for Armenian studies and Hellenistic Judaism at the University of Chicago. He is a recognized authority in the fields of Hellenistic, early Christian, and medieval Armenian literatures, fields in which he has published extensively. He was chair of the Hellenistic Judaism group of the Society of Biblical Literature, SBL, and president of SBL's Midwest region, a Fulbright scholar, and visiting professor at the Hebrew University in 2006, he became the first recipient of the Fulbright Distinguished Chair in the Humanities Award by the Fulbright Foundation and the US Israel Educational Foundation. In 2008, he was elected a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences of the Republic of Armenia. And in 2016, a fellow of the Ambrosian Academy of Milan. In 2018 to 19, he was Robert F. and Margaret S. Goheen Fellow in Classical Philosophy at the National Humanities Center in Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. Dr. Teddy and we are honored to have you with us this evening. Welcome. Thank you, Rhonda, and thank you all who are instrumental in organizing this. When I was asked to give a presentation today, I had a hard time to say no, because we all want to encourage such things. And I, in particular, want to support not just in word, but also in deed by agreeing to make this presentation in the Vemkar series. So Rhonda, RP, Deacon Eric Vossi, Deacon Yervant, and of course, our dear Deacon Vartan, who is helping us today. And above all, I also want to thank the primate of our diocese who encourages such Bible studies, uh, religious studies, studies of the Armenian spiritual heritage. So for all of you, thank you for what you are doing. Perhaps it was providential that I was asked to talk about San Nersesh Norhali because next year, 2023, marks the 850th anniversary of his death. And as it has been in the last century, every 50 years, we have been commemorating his death in these Jubilee 50 year intervals. And so when we think about the 850th anniversary of his death, uh, I don't want to tell too much in advance, but I want to alert all of you that great things will be happening next year. As in many parts of the world, Armenians and non-Armenians alike will be celebrating uh, our beloved Saint Nersesh Norhali, uh, who of course, among other things, is known as a pioneer ecumenist. And for us Armenians, of course, a reforming Katolikos, a hymnographer, a musician, a reformer uh, within the church, and we can go and on about his literary output as a poet. Uh, and for those of you who have read 
the little article that was sent in advance to you, I need not tell more about the greatness of Saint Nersesh Norhavi. Now, what I would like to do for the first 15, 20 minutes or so, could be an hour, half an hour, I'd like to give you an introduction to Saint Nersesh Norhavi, but then that's not all we need to do today. We don't want to just learn about him. I would like us to learn something from him. And so by the end of my talk, the emphasis will be what's there for us to carry over, to take on from what we learned today. And our concluding focus will be on two stanzas from the prayer Havadov Khostovanim, which so many of us love so much. And so let's get a little bit of an introduction. Uh, it might be new for many of you to learn that Saint Nersesh Nohali is actually related to Saint Gregory the Illuminator. Now, some of you may wonder how. Well, it's very simple. Uh, Saint Gregory the Illuminator, who started the line of Armenian hierarchs, Katoigos, he was succeeded by his two sons and then eventually by a grandson and great grandson. And this line of Gregoric Catholicoses ended with Saint Sahag Bartev. So the Gregorids did not die out because a daughter of Sahak Bartev was married to the father of Saint Vartan Mamigonia. So Saint Vartan's mother, being a daughter of Saint Sahak, kind of passed on that whole Gregorian heritage to the Mamigonians. Now, the Mamigonians, on their part, uh, as an Armenian dynasty, Naharar, they were in charge of all the Armenian military endeavors. And it was a hereditary thing within the Mamikonian dynasty from generation to generation to lead out the Armenian armies whenever needed. And the armies, of course, uh, had recruits from all the Armenian dynasties and clans, we call them the Naharars, but they were all under the command of the Mamigonians. Now these Mamigonians, by the end of the eighth and into the ninth century, their dynasty was kind of dwindling and they got intermarried with the Gamsaragans. Now these Gamsaragans, are also known as Bahlavuni. And what is very interesting is that the Gregorids and the Gamsaragans or the Bahlavunis, they all claimed Parthian ancestry. Now, it will not be surprising for us Armenians to remind ourselves that our great illuminator was Parthian. And so were the Kamsaragans, the Bahlavunis. And we may wonder, well, who are the Parthians? Where did they come from? How did they uh, become Armenianized? Um, and so on. Well, just to put it briefly, the Parthians came from Eastern Iran in those days when there were no borders, as we know geopolitics today. Their origin is actually from what is today's Afghanistan. And as they migrated into Iran during the Achaemenid era in the third century before Christ, eventually they became the nobility of the land. And so when the Achaemenid dynasty of the Iranian uh, Shah and Shahs ended, uh, these Parthians established the Arshaguni dynasty. And the branch of it became, of course, uh, an Armenian uh, kingly dynasty, the Arshagunids. 
uh, even our King Dirtat the Great and so forth. So whether the Gregorids or the Arshagunis are all of Parthian origin. Now, they were not limited to ancient Iran. Their dynasties stretched all over Armenia and their ancestral domains like the Gregorids, they were as far west in historic Armenia as you can get uh, in Daranavik and uh, so forth. So this is just a little footnote, so to speak, as to the relationship uh, between the Gregorids and the Neo Gamsaragans, the Bahlavunis. Here you have in front of you a genealogical table. This is very, very illuminating. Of these Bahlavunis, the one we know most about is Grigor Magistros. He lived at the end of the 10th century and into the first half of the 11th. This Grigor Magistros. He was a prince of this Bahlavuni dynasty. Uh, he was born in Pechni, not far from uh, Lake Van. Uh, in fact, one can visit his birthplace. There's a beautiful church there from his time dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. But this Greek or Magistros has preserved a whole dynastic history, which he passed on to his descendants. And to think that these people almost a thousand years after the initial Parthian migration from Afghanistan into Persia and on into Armenia, this was never forgotten for a thousand years and it was passed on from generation to generation. Later on, you will see how important this whole information is. This Greek or Magistros was quite a literary man. Uh, he was a prince, as I said, he had close friendships with the Byzantine emperor, and he often visited Byzantium. And on one of his visits there, he met a Muslim theologian, and as usual, uh, Christians and Muslims began to talk about their religious heritage this Muslim began to deride the Christian Bible saying that we know so many authors who wrote it and everything about uh, the Bible is earthly. We know it's earthly authors, uh, the human hands that wrote it. Whereas the Quran, the sacred book of the Muslims is heaven sent. We don't know the author. It was revealed to Muhammad it is all consistent, there is no contradiction. And not only that, the Quran is inimitable. Nobody can write anything like it. Well, Greek or Magistros tells this Muslim theologian, well, don't fool yourself. Mm -hmm. Most anyone could write something like your Quran. And if you don't believe me, give me four days and I can show you that it is possible. And so this Greek or Magistros uh, takes refuge in a citadel for four days and then he emerges with more than a thousand lines of epic poetry. He has put in epic verse, the whole Bible story from Genesis to Revelation in just a thousand lines or so of epic poetry. Now I mentioned this because this is important because this literary heritage and the dynastic history was passed on from generation to generation. Now, if you look at the middle of the genealogical table, you see Nerses the fourth Shnorhali. So he would be the great grandson of Grigor Magistros and he is the fourth son of Apirat Bahlavuni. These Bahlavunis sometimes they spell their name with P-A-L-H instead of P-A-H-L. Now both are correct, 
but if we were to take it as palhavuni, it further underscores their Parthian origin because Palh is quite a distinguished city in, in Afghanistan. Anyway, so these Pahlavunis or Bahavunis have kept that Parthian heritage. And also when you look at his first son, uh, well, when, when, when we look at Grigor Magistros' uh, son, Grigor Vagayasir, his name was Vahram, Bahram, a very strong Pahlavi name and so forth. Anyway, this genealogical table is a commentary in itself. Now, how did Grigor Magistros get his son, Vahram, become Grigor II Vagayase? Well, this is a long story, but I'll make it short. This Grigor Magistros was instrumental in the surrender of the city of Ani to the Byzantines who were claiming it for themselves. In fact, for uh, a whole dynasty of Byzantine emperors, the Macedonians, they had claims to Armenian lands, even claiming that Armenian kings had willed it to them. And so they compelled Kaki II of Ani to yield his throne and the capital city, Ani, to the Byzantines. And so did other Armenian princes. They were moved to around Sebastia. They were given lands to reciprocate for what they surrendered to the Byzantines. And the Byzantines wanted to protect the Eastern frontiers of the empire until such a time when they learned they couldn't do it, especially after the Battle of Manzigir. Anyway, this Greek or Magistros had befriended the Catholicos of the time, uh, Petros Kedatarts, his successor, Hachid. And what happened is that once the Byzantines got Ani, they decided also to put an end not only to the Armenian kingship, the Pakradets of Ani, but also to end the line of Armenian Gatoligoses, to bring the Armenian church into subjection to the Byzantine church. And so for almost 10 years, there was no Gatoligos. But then there was a Pakradit king of Gars who had not as yet surrendered his throne to the Byzantines. And this King Kakig of Gars struck a deal with the Byzantine emperor who represented the different dynasty. It was an opportune time for him. And so this uh, King of Gars persuaded the new Byzantine emperor, Constantine X, to restore the Armenian Catholicos's line. And so they wanted somebody who was acceptable to the Byzantines, but because Greek or Magistros had such intimate relationship with the Byzantines and the Byzantine emperors and possibly was instrumental in the surrender of Ani and talking King Gakik II of Ani to abdicate. So his son, Varam, he was a military man. He was appointed Gatovigos, the emperor approved, the Byzantine patriarch yielded. And so Vahram, who was Svarabe, the commander, a military man, became Gatovigos. And why do you think he took the name Grigor II? It was to underscore his kinship with Saint Gregory the Illuminator, Krikor the First. So this is a very important thing. And as you can see in this genealogical table, from Krikor the Second as the throne, the Catholic Osate passed on to Krikor the Third and then to Saint Nerses Norhali and after him to a nephew named Krikor Dara, and then Krikor the fifth and sixth. All these were kins. 
roughly speaking, each was succeeded by a nephew. And until after Gregor V, at the bottom of your chart, he was succeeded by a great uncle, Gregor VI. But nearly all these Gatoligoses, especially Gregor III, the fourth, the fifth, these were young men when they were appointed Gatoligoses. Uh, they were 19, 20 years old or in their early 20s. But you can see how this was a dynastic succession of Gatoligoses. Collectively, we refer to these hierarchs as the Bahlavuni Gatoligoses. So a little bit about Krikor the second Vagayas here. He took quite an interest in the lives of the saints and he translated quite a few hagiographies, lives of the saints. And so we could consider him the progenitor of the Armenian Heisma books, uh, the great collection of the lives of the saints in our tradition we owe it to him to have started it. In time, of course, we have three, four different versions of these collections of the Heisma works, the lives of the saints. But what is very interesting about these Greek wars, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, nearly every one of them wrote an ode to Saint Gregory the Illuminator. And they did so to further underscore their kinship and their legitimacy as legitimate successors of the Gregorite line from Saint Gregory the Illuminator through Saint Sahad and on to the present. Okay, well, this will be a good thing to also notice here. In those days, it was, the nobility had actually very little choice as to what to do in their lives. They had to choose either to become a military man or to become a man of the cloth, a religious man. So it was either the military or the monastery. And it is interesting here to notice that uh, a brother of St. Nerses Nor Hali by the name of Shahan, he was Zoravar. And he commanded quite a contingent of Armenians and they were serving as mercenaries, uh, if you don't mind the term. They were even in the service of the Fatimid rulers of Egypt. And so Shahan with his military men established quite an Armenian colony in Egypt. And when Krikor Vagayasir, who could no longer continue in Ani and wherever he moved as a pilgrim Catholicos, the sea or the throne of the Catholicos moved around with him. And so since all of these nobility who had to leave Ani and its vicinity were moved west into the empire, these became the beginnings of the Armenian communities that became Kilikia, beginning with the community around Sebastia, where the Pakradits lived, or were given domains in exchange for Ani and Gars and everything they yielded to the Byzantines. So when Gregor III was kind of a pilgrim Gatoligos, moving from one monastery to another in Kilikia, he also visited Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, he visited Egypt to pay a, a pastoral visit, so to speak, to the 30,000 or so Armenians who lived in Egypt under the command of his, uh, of his son Shahan. Uh, grandson, great grandson Shahan. So, uh, in fact, we know that Greek or Vagayasir possibly made more than one visit to Egypt to be uh, with uh, his kin and the Armenian community who were in Egypt. 
as to what became of them, it's everybody's guess. Probably they were assimilated into the local Christian community. But uh, anyway, let's now move on to the works of Saint uh, Nerses uh, Schnorhali. Uh, as you know, he is called sometimes Goliathsi because he lived in Haromgala, that citadel city on the Euphrates River. Uh, I may ask uh, uh, Deacon Vartan to show us a picture. Yes, this is quite uh, a fortified citadel where St. Nerses lived. Before that, he had lived in another castle in Zovk near Marash, uh, together with his brother, Gregory III. Uh, so this is where the Catholic houses were uh, located. Uh, Gregor III had quite a long reign, almost 50 years. And when he died, uh, Nerses succeeded him, albeit for a short time. But what is important for us to know that nearly everything St. Nerses wrote was written before he was Catholic host. He was kind of his older brother's, Gregory III's right hand man. And so it was Nerses who took the initiatives in the conciliation with the Greeks. And this was at a very hard time for the Armenians because the Greeks not only had dispossessed them from their kingship, the Greeks tried to end the line of Catholic process, but even the Greek church, the Greek patriarchate had very uh, inimical uh, relationship, uh, non-friendly toward the Armenian church simply because of Christological issues. And for St. Nerses to take initiatives in those days to make peace with the Greeks, it was indeed a very, very uh, great manifestation of magnanimous spirit, a true Christian spirit of humility to uh, be uh, in such uh, friendly terms with the Greeks to the point of seeking unity of the churches. This was, of course, also commands that his church be one and to make peace with the Greeks in spite of all this uh, animosity between the Byzantines and the Greeks, mostly because of minor religious variations having to do with Christology. So St. Nerses was 50 years old when he wrote his most significant work, Jesus the Son. Uh, it was written in 1153, uh, Jesus the Son. This particular book, I would say, is so much to be cherished as it was at one time among Armenians. One could say after the book of St. Gregory of Narek, Jesus the Son was the most favorite book and most read book among Armenians. In Jesus the, the Son, we have the whole Christology of the Armenian church, who Jesus is, what he came for, namely to bring about our redemption, the very reason for the incarnation, and how he brought this redemption about, namely by his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, and of course his second coming. But what is so beautiful about this whole epic of Jesus the Son, uh, Saint Nerse Shnorhali learned to do such writings from his great grandfather, uh, Grigor Magistros. You recall the epic which Grigor Magistros wrote the whole Bible in verse from Genesis to Revelation in a thousand lines. Here, Saint Nerse Shnorhali divides the life of Christ into three parts. The first part being pure theology, Christology as to who Jesus is. And 
each part consists of more than a thousand lines. So in other words, this epic of the life of Jesus is three times the length of the first literary epic in Armenian literature by Grigor Magistros. Uh, and so what is so beautiful about Jesus the Son, this is written as verse. And just like the epic by uh, Nerses's great-grandfather, uh, Grigor Magistros, it's very interesting that these verses end in monorhyme. They end with the rhyme in, 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 in. And this is in keeping with the dominant rite of the Quran, because you remember Magistros was challenged that the Quran is inimitable. Nobody could write anything like it, but he showed that yes, you could. And so just like Magistros, Nersei Shnorali wrote this epic in this monoran in. What I like most about this Jesus the Son is that it's not just telling the life of Jesus, giving us the Christology of Jesus the proclamation of the gospel and so on. What is so important in this is that in every telling of the story or every saying of Jesus, St. Nersei Shnorhali places himself in the picture. He wants to apply what he just mentioned to himself. Uh, I can give you hundreds of examples, but let me just give you one of my favorite ones. We all know the parable of the 10 talents when a master called his three servants to one, he gave 10 talents to another five, to another one. And uh, we know what the third servant did. He buried his talent. And when he was summoned to give an account, he just returned to the master, the very coin or talent he had received. And we know how he was condemned for not having used his talent. Well, St. Nersei Shnorhali, when he's talking about that parable, uh, he says, well, I'm worse than that servant who buried his talent because I lost mine. <laughs> so just think of it. Worse than having buried his talent, he has lost it. Well, of course, this is a part of confessional uh, genre in which uh, the author not only puts himself down, but he takes the opportunity to show his utter sinfulness and his dependence on divine mercy and grace and redemption. Uh, now, Saint Nersei Shnorhali has several other great works. Let me refer you to another one. This is on the fall of Edessa. Uh, the city of Edessa was a great center of Eastern Christianity from where actually Christianity uh, in the tradition of King Abgar from Edessa came into Armenia even long before Saint Gregory the Illuminator. In his lament over the fall of Edessa, uh, which uh, consists in 2,000 verses of, again, epic verse lamenting the fall of Edessa uh, to the, cell, to the uh, ruler of Aleppo when the Muslims overran the blessed city of Edessa, a big cradle of Eastern Christianity. This compelled Saint Nersesh Norhali to write a lament in some 2000 uh, verses of lamentation. But this is a beautiful lament in that uh, Edessa is personified as a sorrowful woman who calls other women to join her in her sorrow to lament this great loss in Christendom, uh, the fall of the city of Edessa. And by the way, 
most everything St. Nerses wrote in turn inspired successive writers to write things like he did. For example, very much like this lament over Edessa, uh, his successor, Gregory IV or Cricor de la, wrote a whole lament over the fall of Jerusalem to Saladin. And a couple centuries later, when Constantinople fell to the Ottomans, uh, others, Parishetsi, and even uh, others who wrote laments over the fall of Constantinople. Now, of course, we remember Saint Nesesh Norhali because of his input into the Sharag notes, the Sharagans, the hymnal of the Armenian church. This massive hymnal of the Armenian church, the Sharag notes, this was edited for the last time during the Catholic Osset of Saint Nersesh Norhali, and given his great talent of composing hymns, uh, he was uh, instrumental not only in editing the Armenian hymnal, but contributing nearly a fifth of it written by himself, his predecessors, uh, and also uh, uh, his helpers at the time. Uh, especially a nephew of his who is known as Saint Nerses of Lampron. But the book, the Sharagan or the Sharagmots was codified in his time. Uh, I don't have time to tell you about his big contribution to this, but my favorite ones are his uh, hymns on the Holy Spirit. As you know, in the Armenian church, we have five feasts we call them the minical feasts, Dagavaratzdon, like Christmas, um, Easter, uh, Vartavar, uh, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and then Khachveratz. These are big feasts of eight day duration, a whole week. But Saint Nirse Norhali was uh, thinking that the Feast of Pentecost deserves just as much celebration. And so he composed wonderful hymns for a whole week to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. I've written about this. Uh, I don't uh, have to get overboard with this, but uh, these hymns to the Holy Spirit in turn inspired his nephew, Saint Nerses of Lampron, to write a beautiful homily, a discourse on the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, Saint Nersesh Norhali wrote a lot of uh, poetic verse. It is collected in a little book, we're little by size, but has a lot of pages in which we have a whole collection of his writings in verse. Uh, these are, uh, at monetary writings, uh, Hortorags. He wrote uh, uh, quite a few riddles, you know, in those days when there was no radio, no television. Uh, storytelling was one nice pastime. He also wrote quite a number of riddles, but these were kind of quizzes, like a Bible quiz. Um, it was more than half a century ago when I read those, but if I remember one, and I hope I'm not mistaken in this, just to give you an example of the many riddles he wrote, here is one. Uh, what was it that killed many more in death than it did in its lifetime? So this is a riddle. And the answer is the jawbone of the ass, the donkey, with which Samson killed hundreds of Philistines. Uh, anyway, but uh, if we were to really think of all the works that Saint Nersesh Norhali has written together, they are so voluminous. In fact, at the Madena Taran in Yerevan, where the ancient Armenian manuscripts are kept, they are editing a whole series of all the writings by the Armenian church fathers. This series is called 
Mademaki Kayot. Uh, in fact, the last two volumes in the series, here's, you can see how uh, by now this series is more than 20 volumes and volumes 21 and 22 and hopefully into volume 23, these will be the collected works of San Nersesh Norhali. So when we think of all these writings by San Nersesh Norhali, we cannot help but just say, wow, for such an inspired writer to give us so much. We cannot really exhaust studying everything San Nerses wrote. Uh, wish to God I had more time to tell you how he composed so many of his poetic verses. We have uh, all his writings that begin with the letter Nerses because every stanza spells a letter of his name. So when he writes such things to begin with, uh, the letter N, he would be writing things that have to begin with a word with the letter N. And as a rule, this initial word of his compositions in onomastic acrostics would begin with the word nor. Nor yerk yerk etsek. Uh, let us sing the new song to the Lord to quote the words of the psalm. And I have collected scores of his writings that begin with the word nor, just to see what's new in this composition by St. Nerses. And so I'm currently working on a study titled The Ever New in St. Nerses Norhali, just being inspired by his initial lines of the hundreds of compositions by him. Now, having told so much about his hymns and prayers and admonitions, the Hortorax, it is good for just a couple of minutes, as I have time, to draw your attention to the one prayer we all love, Havadov Kostovan. I learned that today's focus is on two stanzas of this prayer. Uh, the one which Father Samuel uh, prayed for us as we began our prayer, uh, our session with prayer this afternoon. And the very words, Havadov Hostovanim, with faith I confess, or I confess with faith. You know, however we translate these initial words, Havadov Hostovanim, here I should tell briefly how at San Nerses, during the last couple of years when I was there, together with Dr. Irvin and our primate Bishop Daniel, we thought about producing a San Nerses version of Havadov Hostovanim. And the three of us put our heads together and came up with a whole new translation of Havadov Hostovanim. And I remember the debates, how to begin. With faith I confess, in faith I confess. But the Armenian word is instrumental, Havadov Hostovanim. Now here I would take just a couple of minutes to tell you what does it mean for an Armenian like San Nersesh Norhali to use this word, Havadov Hostovanim. What does faith mean to Armenians? Here I want to draw a distinction between the Western approach to faith in Western Christianity and the approach to faith in Eastern Christianity as in the Armenian tradition. In Western Christianity, Faith is based on evidence. There has to be proof, something concrete, something convincing uh, upon which to build one faith. You need proof. This kind of Western thinking about faith continues even in Protestantism, uh, where you need a proof text 
to start your faith, uh, be it a proof text from the Bible or some convincing element that compels you to be persuaded to believe. In other words, it's based on knowledge and evidence and proof. Now that's the Western approach. In the Eastern approach, it's a little bit different. We believe not because we know or because we are absolutely sure or we know for sure. It is not based on proof. It doesn't seek for evidence. It takes all that for granted. That's no question. We believe not because of the evidence, not because of the proof, not because we know, but we believe because we do not know. And our church fathers liked the book of Job. There are at least half a dozen early Armenian commentaries on the book of Job, especially the last chapter. We even have a commentary by attributed to St. Gregory of Narek on the last chapters of the book of Job. These are very important. You recall the story of Job, how he was smitten with every calamity one could think about and how he ended up in a miserable condition. And his supposed helpers, three of them, three times each, were to comfort him that he must have done something wrong you better remember, recall, confess what you have done wrong and God may forgive you. You may be restored to what you were blessed with before. And poor Job for the life of him, he couldn't think of any. Uh, and at the end of it all, chapters 40, 41 in the book of Job, when God speaks, he tells Job and all these people who tried to comfort him, you don't know how God works. You are just hypothesizing as to the reason for why things get wrong, why these calamities, why pain, why suffering. You theorize on these things when you don't know how God works. Nobody knows how God works. In fact, nobody knows how God created the world because nobody was there to see how God created the world. Not Moses, not anyone. Now, of course, the lesson of it all is that, and taking the book of Job as an example, as it meant to our Armenian church fathers, we don't know. God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. Now, because God knows everything, what should my response of faith be? My response would be, I will leave it to God. I don't know. And since only God knows, I will surrender. I will yield it to God. And interestingly enough, St. Nersesh Norhali comes exactly to this point in the 16th stanza of his prayer. Let us look at stanza 16, and this will be our closing prayer. But before I conclude this with the prayer, prayer 16, uh, let me tell you that when we read this prayer by St. Nersesh Norhali, we are missing something important. St. Nersesh Norhali wrote a two-page preface to this prayer with 24 stanzas. In this two page preface, he makes two points. Number one, if you are a Christian, you ought to pray. You ought to pray every hour if you can, but I know you're busy, you cannot. Pray at least half of what I have for you. If not, pray six, if not, pray three. If no time at all, pray just one. You cannot call yourself a Christian and go about your daily life without prayer. So here is something for you to pray. 
The second point he makes in page two of his preface is, when you pray, you ought to understand. You should know what you're praying. If you don't understand what you're praying, then you haven't prayed. And so he says, I've written this prayer for you in the simplest terms so that you can understand your prayer when you pray. And so when we pray this number 16, my God, you who open your hand and fill all your creatures by your mercy, I entrust myself to you. I entrust myself to you. This is faith at its height. God knows I don't know. And since God knows, I leave it to God. I entrust all to you, my God. Take care of me and provide what is needful for my body and soul from now on and forever. Have mercy upon your creatures and on me, a great sinner. Thank you and thank you, Lord. Amen.